get started. Uh, thank you for everyone who came. Um, I'm very glad some people are still interested in JavaScript, uh, so I'm, I'm happy you guys turned up. So the talk is basically a high-level overview of performing a code review on the JavaScript applications. Um, there's going to be, you know, some things around, you know, an introduction to JavaScript. Um, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So that's first about me. Okay. So I'm a senior security consultant at Synopsys. Um, formerly, I was at Sigital, um, but after we got acquired by Synopsys, so I now work at Synopsys. Uh, I've Roughly have about four years experience in the security space, uh, primarily looking at well application security. Uh, I'm also a PhD candidate at Leeds Beckett University looking into browser security. Um, and prior to Sigital, I was uh, I did a, a degree at, in Leeds during a, I did my BSc in ethical hacking. I also founded the Ethical Hacking Society after seeing the success of Arbate's um, society. And I did a bit of software development and uh, security consultancy as well. So Synopsys are primarily, they came from hardware, so the, the whole concept was silicon to software. Um, so the Software Integrity Group was um, introduced to basically try and tackle some of the software security problems. Um, the team consists of a wide range of different organizations that have been acquired over the time, which is like Black Dog, which looks for things like uh, privacy violations in uh, third-party software. Coverity is basically a static analysis tool that identifies security vulnerabilities. Codenomicon is for things like fuzzing and looking at protocols. Uh, Sigital was primarily a uh, security consultancy, and Codescope was our e-learning platform, along with um, some uh, IDE integrations for uh, helping developers write better code. So today I'm going to talk about the JavaScript landscape and talk about JavaScript security issues. Uh, I'll briefly go over static code analysis and the review methods. And I'll also talk about the challenges that come when you're actually doing uh, JavaScript code analysis. I'll also talk about some tools and the way to automate tools uh, and uh, customizing <coughs> certain tools to be extended to use for things like new frameworks. So the JavaScript landscape. I want to go from the beginning and we'll go to where we currently are in, in the real world. So before um, we get into anything, I'll kind of just show you uh, if anyone is still, um, where, which way does this go? Does it go this way? Yeah. So this is what the web used to look like. Um, I still sometimes come to this website because I love Space Jam, so that's pretty good. But yeah, I mean, the web was basically just a bunch of marquees and H1 tags and a bit of uh, JPEGs. So um, in the early, let's just go back to my slides. Um, in the early days, um, there was this need for JavaScript. So uh, there was this whole concept of e-commerce platforms who actually needed to you know, retain state and have some kind of presence of a user. So they introduced things like cookies. But JavaScript was introduced into the Netscape Navigator browser back in 1995. Uh, there was kind of like a, a war between Java applets, but it was soon swiftly dead. Um, and you know, over the time, uh, they kind of needed to standardize JavaScript. So there's this whole concept of the ECMAScript uh, international organization, and they create standards for web stand. They create uh, kind of standardization things for web, and JavaScript conforms to that standard. You know, many years ago, the web was predominantly server-based, and you know, if you take a look at um, an application built back in the 2000 era, you were mainly looking at a bit of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the client. And then everything was basically done on the server. So you had you know, .NET, .php, sorry, PHP, and so on, which was basically doing everything for you. And the client wasn't really a, a, a thing. Um, so the old view was that you just had to protect the server. And of course, we've seen things like cross-site scripting and so on, where you actually need to look at the client side as well. So I had a couple of arguments with uh, some of my colleagues around this quote. But on the 2016 developer survey, uh, JavaScript was classed as the most commonly used programming language on Earth. So we've got developers who are in the full stack space, writing front end code and back end code, are now all utilizing JavaScript in some way. And in the 2017 survey, um, it essentially mentions for the last five years, <laughs> JavaScript is still number one in the most popular and used uh, language. I kind of don't want to make the joke, but you know, if you get in these summaries from Stack Overflow, it kind of shows how much uh, Developers seem to have problems when writing JavaScript. So, anyway. So, when I think about full stack JavaScript, um, 
you can kind of switch out the client for different kinds of interpretations. But if anyone who knows me, I'm a big Angular JS fan, so a lot of the core, a lot of the presentation will kind of fall under that realm today, but not you know completely. Um, but full stack is basically you offer like a low barrier of entry into writing client side and server side code. And this is because you know the client side can be Angular JS or React or no sorry Ember or Backbone JS, and then the server could ultimately be something like the Node.js uh, language with Express JS, um, which is bolted on as a framework to use as a server. And then even the database is written in JavaScript. So you know you've got this client side code interacting with JavaScript on the on the server, which is interacting with a JavaScript database, which is quite interesting in many ways. So let's, I, I like to be reactive. You know, that's a nice React joke right there. Um, and the web is ultimately changing at like a very fast speed. Uh, you know, developers are you know, writing various frameworks to tackle certain problems. And you know, that when they're trying to tackle those certain problems, they're introducing all these w new, wonderful, weird features that people utilize. And we don't really know if they come with security issues or not. So, Frameworks like AngularJS and React, they come with some quite secure defaults by design. Um, but there's a wonderful presentation, well, a blog post by uh, Gareth Hayes from Portswigger, who basically talks about you know, abusing JavaScript frameworks by, by bypassing XSS mitigations. And this is when you trust frameworks, for example, in this instance, it was Marvo.io, you had the ability to um, bypass, um, well, introduce cross-site scripting because you were explicitly trusting this framework. And from what I've seen, this might not be true for all organizations. A lot of teams tend to transition into different um, prototypes, at least to when they're building applications every couple of years, at least between the two to three year mark. And from what I've seen, and some people may disagree, uh, automated security tools are very slow to adopt, adopt these frameworks. Like, for example, um, Fortify is a you know automatic code scanning tool, and it only recently started to scan things like um, AngularJS. So I'm going to talk about some JavaScript security issues now. And um, it's only three of them, and then we'll jump into the kind of code scanning side of things. So I have a few personal tips if anyone is kind of new to JavaScript or they haven't really started to look at frameworks and libraries. Um, you don't have to be proficient in each language you look at, you know, but if your team are specializing in a certain framework, you kind of want to learn all those idioms. Um, Understand how the framework works. Understanding all those kind of intricate parts can be allow you to actually read the code easier. Um, that, that's how I kind of pick it up. So I normally build applications uh, to kind of understand the concept and how the logical flow of the application works. Before you start looking at the entire landscape of security issues in a framework, you should try and um, pick you know one issue and learn it well first. So understand every kind of, you know, the reason why it exists, why it's a problem, and then ultimately getting down to the bare bones on how to actually secure it. And then always keep documentation uh, with this, these issues that you identify because they're gonna be a good uh, reference to one, you can show developers, or two, you can just use as a reference um, to understand the security issues that you saw in the past. And use tools, but don't rely on them because there's many pitfalls with tools. It only can identify things that it's been wrote to find. And um, you know, there's lots of limitations and they're very noisy. And uh, sometimes using a trained eye can actually be quite beneficial when looking at um, JavaScript code or any language or any framework in general. Oh, backlight went out. So I'm gonna cover uh, three things today. So, um, the dynamic execution of JavaScript uh, is generally covered by things like automated code scanning. So I'm going to kind of show um, the way that we are in the world now when it comes to d dynamic execution of JavaScript. I'm also going to talk about a security issue that kind of talks about cross-origin. And th this, this issue in particular is often misunderstood by developers and security consultants. But from what I've seen, uh, even though the tools do report the use of post message, it doesn't necessarily mean the developers have fixed the problem. And then I'm briefly going to talk about client-side trust, and this is what um, automated tools generally don't find, because when you think about the client, um, ultimately there's things like authorization, which are done on the server, but the tools don't know that you're implementing these things, and like they only can identify actual implementation bugs rather than you know um, uh, design flaws. <coughs> 
So when we think about JavaScript execution, um, normally you think about um, cross-site scripting on the browser. Now, of course, with the introduction to Node.js, that changes things, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you know, there's multiple ways to do um, cross-site scripting, and one of them is basically when data falls inside an evaluation or dynamic um, expression. And you know, eval in many ways and, and XX script and set timeout are quite beautiful in many ways because um, these are generally what are used to bypass a lot of filters because you have things like you know you can do string concatenation with uh, you know including multiplication so that's uh, quite you know quite fantastic in many ways um, you know the XX script function you know runs on uh, the window object and it also allows execution of JavaScript as well so. These are all things that are generally used by developers, and you know you would use like a set timeout to wait for a second if an async call or a, syn or a synchronous call hasn't finished yet. Those kind of things. So when we think about dynamic execution of JavaScript, you know, we used to just have the client side code where you would call alert document domain, and it would all be concatenated, go from string, string concatenation into one basically query. But when you take a look at the server. Uh, you know, this is kind of where the worlds collide, and we now have actually remote code execution through dynamic execution of JavaScript. So I'm going to quickly show you a demo um, of what I'm trying to um, mean with this. Let's throw it onto the other screen if I can. There we go. There we go. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. So first, I'll show the use of um, client-side e execution. So when you have like a username, and you're in inserting something like script alert one, and then you're inserting a URL with our eval function, which basically will do string concatenation and execute. Obviously, when you click submit, and if data is explicitly trusted on a browser, um, you will actually it will actually execute, and it will like be brought together, and you will execute your you know document dot domain, and it will obviously alert bookmarks.com in this instance. And as you can see, like the data here is explicitly trusted. So if we you know, refresh the browser, it's persisted and it's an issue. <coughs> but then when you actually take a look at the server and imagine you're working with a Node.js application. Now, I'm going to try and pause it for a second. So we have like a clear temp function here, which basically is taking a request and a response. This then takes the request body of eval, ultimately eval, is assigned to the user input, and then it's injected into an eval function. And then that data is then returned. So let's continue the example. So because of this, the user input is going to be explicitly trusted and actually evaluated against the server. The whole concept for this actually is, oh, now that I've paused it, down at the bottom, all it's doing is reading the file sync. And all it wants to do is we try and retrieve like a logs file. So if we intercept with burp, because obviously this is a dynamic application and we're testing it in that way. And then we then go to clear the logs. All this is doing is calling that function, which is meant to pull the logs out. And as, it, as you can see, it returns that. But then obviously, if you take a look at what we talked about before, where you can start to interact with the server due to this evaluation, what you're actually going to then go and get is um, basically remote code execution by, you know, for example, you call the file system. You say, you know, I want to read the file sync and I want to make sure it returns to me, so which is why we call the file sync. And then we ask for the etc passwords. What we're actually going to get is, um, you know, code execution uh, from the browser. Sorry, from the server to the browser. Whenever it's a very slow demo. I'm sorry. <laughs> so as you can see, you know, now we've returned the the, the, the other side of things. Now let's now close this off so I can go back to my. There we go. Great. So. As you can see, like worlds have definitely changed from you know the early days of 1995 to now, where we now have you know execution of JavaScript on the server and rather than the client. So, websites by default are um, basically have to follow the same origin policy, and this prevents attacker.com talking to Gmail and retrieving the contents of Gmail, and Facebook.com trying to ask for things from Gmail. Now. Window.postmessage basically enables you to send messages to and from different windows. Um, and there's also other things like you know, JSONP, which allows you to do JavaScript callbacks. And there was also things like cores that allow you to um, define what websites can return the content. Because any website can send a request. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get a response. 
And this can happen in two instances where a page um, spawns a pop-up or you know, an iframe of an embedded uh, instance. So if you take a look at this, this example here, we're create, to send a message just to a different server, you create a window, like normally we'd have like open window here, then that target window would send a post message and you're sending a message to that server. And this basically normally can define the origin, but at this instance, we're just ignoring it. Then the other website would set up an event listener with the, um, with, uh, the message attribute. And then basically when this gets sent to the other origin, it will then basically console log that event data and the event data is send message. Now, the security vulnerability here is that if you do not validate what origins can talk to your post message, uh, it actually will allow you to retrieve that content or potentially communicate with it and from a, a different origin or an attacker.com origin, which will allow you to execute and steal things. And I'm gonna show you how that works in a second. So this is an example from when we reviewed a client-side code and they had a legacy application. And what they wanted to do was actually go away and um, create a client's ang AngularJS client side, and they wanted to be able to share the configuration of that. So they were using a post message as an iframe to actually then just retrieve that information so they can capture their JSON web token, which allowed them to communicate. Obviously, JSON web tokens is just what a lot of um, new applications tend to use for, uh, for you know, being auth authenticated. So. In this instance, it says we have a get config, and that's basically uh, what gets sent by the user. And all it's doing, I can't really see it from here, but basically we're checking to see if that key is the config that gets sent. And it's going to wrap this event data and then create the post message to send it back. So it has an event listener waiting to receive the message. And as long as this matches, it's then going to return this information back to the page as long as an event list is set up. So to show this in context as an exploit, all you're gonna do is basically set up an event listener to receive the message back. And then basically all I'm doing is alerting that event data that gets sent back to me. But I'm creating a set timeout with the run function of five milliseconds, which is five seconds. And then I'm calling post message on the window I wanna execute, and I'm basically sending get config. So what this is going to do is gonna send a request to the, the um, vulnerable server say, give me the information, and that server is then going to respond it back to me. So now I'm going to show you another demo of this in action. Oh, I'm enjoying the app. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I don't know how to, hang on. Oh, thank you. Okay, so now if we go back to the beginning again, I'm going to talk through that again. So as you can see, we've got an event listener that is um, basically you know, going to be listening for a response in. And as you can see, we've got the app config of get config. So uh, as long as that config is matching uh, this get configuration, it's going to return this data. So obviously, we need to pass that data as well to, to actually read it in the correct format. So you know, it takes the event data, and then it checks it to see if it actually matches. And then it will wrap it in this event data, and then return the data to us. So in a second, I'm about to show the exploit um, and show the same steps. So let's say we've got the set timeout and it runs in five seconds. Uh, and we're basically calling the post message of get config. And we're opening, obviously sending it to the vulnerable window. And again, we're, we're ignoring this because it, when it's a wildcard, it's just ignored. But as you can see, well, now that I'll, I'll, when I'll go back to it, but basically the reason why this comes back to the user is because they choose the target origin to come back. So the event origin, so whatever made the request, they chose the event origin and the comeback. So as you can see, if we choose attacker.com and send it to the vulnerable page, that opens up a window. And if we go back to that page, it's going to give us back the JSON web token after five seconds. So uh, in the application, this actually gave the full JWT, not just the string token. So the way to fix this would actually be to validate the origins that you trust. So you would first just include um, the event origin. And if it's coming from a website that we trust, then uh, if it's not coming from a website that we don't trust, we're going to just return. And if it is this origin, then it's going to execute everything else. So if we try that payload again, it's not going to work. So from attacker.com. After five seconds, it won't execute anymore because it's being rejected because it's not a valid origin to talk to the application. So then if we go to um, example.com because it's validated and the same thing happens, it will return back the, uh, the data that we need. 
And this is obviously what you want to try and achieve. Okay. So yeah, what I meant here is basically um, go back to here. So in the post message, we're returning back to uh, the event we want to send it to. So rather than having the wildcard. So a common you know, issue with web applications is client-side trust. And you know, when developers create applications, they often think that JavaScript is running on the client. And the client isn't you know, knowing uh, that, that the interpretation is that actually attackers can't access this. And you know, there's a lot of wrong assumptions that you know, data on the client is not accessible. And when data is submitted by the client, uh, you know, it's, it's controlled by the server side. But in fact, data that is stored on the client is definitely accessible by attackers. If you think about things like cross-site scripting, you know, actions performed on the client uh, are fully can be fully controlled by attackers through things like XML HTTP or creating like a, a form to send a request via the application, uh, and you know other things like capturing like the, the local storage or the, the cookie and so on. And it's some important things to think about as well is. You know, HTML storage uh, persists, and you shouldn't save inf like sensitive information in things like um, cached packages or form data or cookies. Um, and you also um, should only use session storage because it, when you close the browser, it, it basically clears everything out of the session storage. But that doesn't happen for local storage. And I've left a nice little blog um, from uh, someone that I like to dib, dub I'm loving it because. Um, what actually happened uh, was there was an AngularJS application and they found a, a way to basically do um, client-side um, cross-site scripting. And what actually then happened was they were doing <laughs> password encryption on the client and they were able to use cross-site scripting to then, um, and they were, it was using the same key. So that you're basically able to decrypt it. You know, obviously you shouldn't be using the encryption anyway. And then you could then use the cross-site scripting to send the password to you. So if, if anyone wants to take a look at that, I would highly recommend it. So, and then there's one more thing. So when you start to look at um, JavaScript uh, client-side applications, like I like to look at AngularJS, and there's two things that point out to me here. When you see like things like ng-show or ng-hide, these are client-side checks. They're basically JavaScript Boolean checks to see, have I fulfilled this and have I fulfilled this? And with AngularJS, there's also client-side routing. So ultimately, when you try and go to forward slash users as someone who's logged in, if this isn't met, the JavaScript won't allow you, but it's all on the client side, it can all be tampered with. And there's a lot of push from the server to the client, and ultimately what happens is a lot of people now don't actually add those um, server-side checks, and this is all they tend to use. And it's I've done a lot of code reviews, and I would say, they, they do it right for most instances, but there have been quite a few occasions where they've only relied on the client and you've been able to you know, gain a higher level of privilege due to this. So now I want to talk quickly about static code analysis and review methods. So let's talk about the concept of walking the tree. So when we think about manual code review or doing code review in general, it's quite a boring process. There's sometimes millions and millions of lines of code to look at, maybe not in the JavaScript sense, but definitely in legacy applications. And the whole term of static analysis is to basically automate the process of using uh, code review. So um, it's normally carried out in the implementation phase of the software development lifecycle. And basically, this just means the code level. So if we take a look at this uh, diagram, when you're building an application, you normally have an SDLC, and you normally start with requirements and use cases, and you go into architecture and design, and then you go into test cases, and ultimately then you get to your code when the actual implementation phase happens. And this is where normally you would try and utilize tools or perform code audits from a from a you know external perspective. And this also tends to you know identify security vulnerabilities that were introduced due to coding errors and uh, security vulnerabilities that were you know, ultimately introduced uh, maliciously in the source code. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about the underlying process of generally how things come into the past of actually static, static code analysis, but, and this is more of like from an interpreter sense as well. So 
Normally you start off with source codes, and if you just have source codes, it's just numbers to a machine. So normally they go through this process of um, so they build tokens, and these tokens are basically just the breakdown points of um, each thing. So like var would be var, and when you go into the token sense, you also need to take in a lot of things into consideration, like does white space matter? Because in JavaScript it doesn't, but if you're looking at things like Python, certainly matters. So this whole concept of lexical analysis is taking those to tokens and basically converting it into more readable speech. And then data is then passed. And there's also um, things which are taken into consider considered uh, there as well, which is basically are things like, you know, uh, characters allowed in variable names or are there reserved words or are there decimal literals or string literals and so on. And then ultimately you get to the semantics of each language. So each language comes with its own unique properties and those things need to be taken into consideration. But then what we really care about is ignore all of that is basically the abstract syntax tree. So this is generally what code review tools or linters or style things st like styles basically use to basically um, walk and identify issues in. So I'll briefly show you a, uh, an example of this. So if we go to the AST Explorer, let's see where it opened. Oh, where's my machine gun? No, 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 over here. So, so if we take a look at this and we just decide that we want to use JavaScript with the, let's just say Babel ASLint parser. When you take a look at code and you do var x, you know, equal, oh, var x equals foo, this ultimately means there's a variable declaration with a call expression. So, and ASTs are specific to each language, so this doesn't really change unless like new things come into the framework. So if we take a look at this side, as you can see, we've got our variable declaration you know, of x, and then ultimately further on down the chain, there's a call expression, and a call expression is just something that has a curly brace or so on. So when you start to be able to read these trees and walk the tree in sense, you can actually start to like look for security issues or in a sense, code quality issues. Okay, so I'm going to go in a bit more detail about, you know, using an AST to basically pass code in a little bit, but I would highly recommend taking a look at these resources if you're interested in this area. The first video is very good and it basically talks about how to build a programming language from scratch. The interpreter book is very good about building your own interpreter and language. Uh, obviously the AST Explorer is very good in a sense of understanding how an AST is and how you can pass it or things you might require. And then there's also this resource which basically visualizes ASTs and gives you a, a representation. So there's a lot of challenges when it comes to JavaScript static analysis. And the first one, which is always interesting, is that everything in JavaScript is an object. And you know, because of this, um, it's a prototypical language and basically every, it's a dynamic language and everything generally is um, processed at runtime. So uh, every JavaScript uh, object has a prototype object which can be overwritten. So if you're trying to do static analysis, you actually have to keep track of these changes. So if we take a look at this example, we have a person and it basically takes in a name and it assigns that name to, to a variable. Then I create a new user, or a, new, a new person called Lewis and I call it person one. But then I overwrite the property of two string. And now this two string is basically just returning the name. So it's actually doing something different than what it was intended to do. So it's returning the name rather than just um, returning, uh, well, ultimately you would still return you know, the two string function, but you can overwrite those properties. Then variables can, of JavaScript can also contain different types. So, um, you know, most languages like Java or like sensible languages, you normally define things like string or an int and so on. But everything in JavaScript, like a variable, can be of type string or of type variable of, of an integer or numbers in this sense. So what this is doing is basically one, we're making sure something is a Boolean to true. And if that Boolean is true, then we're assigning this literal string to the variable. Else, then, you know, we're assigning the variable to 69. And that's probably the only time I'll ever get like a joke like that in. So I'll move on. Uh, so, um, and more wonderful things about JavaScript is um, as type coercion. So normally when you're, you know, making sure something is of, of something, you're doing like a double equals or a triple equals. 
like an exact match or and they have that concept of loosely versus um, strictly typed. So what um, basically type coercion is, it's converting an object to a, a different um, type and it's checking to see if the value inside matches. So when we look at like false equals to double equals to one, it's false. But then if you look at false double equals to zero, it's true, which is a bit weird to see. And obviously if you're doing it like strictly, it's then actually only like looking to see if this would actually be false. So this is also something that needs to be taken into consideration. And there's actually now with the introduction of Node.js, there's been a lot of security issues around this where uh, a value might equal to null in some senses because of type coercion. And there was an issue with socket IO, which is like due to web sockets. And uh, it was a broken implementation of their certificates for SSL. So it was just allowing anything because it was null. And it's like, yep, fine. But it would have been actually fixed with that. JavaScript even has higher order functions, so you need to take this into consideration where one function can call another function. So in this instance, we have uh, basically a person which takes in a value and the value is set to value, or you can call the get and set function, which calls another function, which one will just return the value or one which will set the value. So in this case, you know, we're creating two people, one which is Lewis and 69. The second one, we you know get in the first output and then the second output, and then we're changing that value again to JSON and then you know, the output again for JSON. And these are also things that when you're looking at codes, they can become quite complex from a code analysis perspective. And JavaScript by default is quite forgiving. Um, there's, you know, it basically you can have broken code. You can have var equals x and never actually use it. Or you can have x equals y as long as it's not in strict, strict mode, then it's perfectly fine. Um, so, what actually developers introduced was this concept of you know strongly typed JavaScript, and you know strongly typed JavaScript equals less bugs, and it, and it's true. So rather than just having something of a type which could be an integer or it could be uh, a string, you actually can create interfaces where you can define the name of string, the age of number, and if that person's alive to a boolean, and then you can assign that and set it here. And if this was actually trying to be an integer it would complain and say, actually, no, that's wrong. And it would complain. And it stops a lot of those issues happening by default. And you know, JavaScript is uh, universal in many ways. It's an internet of things. It's on the server. It's on the browser. And you know, a lot of people want to be able to create you know, unique um, you know, solutions to problems. And they kind of have to tr sometimes convert it into JavaScript for it to be adopted and used. So there's things like you know GWT for Java to TypeScript, sorry Java to Java, JavaScript, TypeScript which is like typely st strongly typed JavaScript to JavaScript. There's also things like PyScript to Python to JavaScript and FunScript to F# -sharp to JavaScript. And there's more. There's a lot more. And what we're trying to starting to see is that um, there's quite low support uh, when it comes to automated code scanning tools to actually support these languages, because <coughs> There's really no need to, uh, in a sense, because you're basically having to transpile that code to JavaScript for it to be in interpreted anyway in the browser or on the server. So I, in, in, in a real world scenario, security issues can still be found when you're writing in these languages, but you would have to identify it in the JavaScript code and then basically map it back to that strongly typed language. And, <coughs> sorry. New features such as ES6, EX7, 7, and 8, you know, also require updates to the static analysis process. So for things like arrow functions, a, a previous tool wouldn't have known that that might have been a function, just sees it as an arrow. So these things need to be taken into consideration. So now I'm going to talk about a concept of data flow analysis. So it's following uh, the data through source to sync and see if at any point where that is tainted. So hopefully everyone will be able to see my code. And it's going to be interesting to, to try and do this and explain it from this side. Oh. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Right. So hopefully everyone can see this. But we have a simple Node.js application that is basically doing the very similar thing that we saw in the example today. And as you can see, we've got a basically a get function that takes in check logs and we have the request and the, uh, the response. So when you're doing data flow analysis, you would want to look at see like, okay, 
when data comes in, it's normally coming from the request, and we want to see if any data then is taken from user input, for example, or a downstream and upstream system. And then we want to see that, okay, that actually request query for, of eval is then set to user input. And then that user input is then evaluated. So as you can see here, like this is going from a source, then into a sync, and ultimately all this is doing is exactly the same concept as before, but basically calling get logs on uh, the file system. So if we see this in practice, um, if I can get my browser to pull over. Um, okay. Yeah. So we have this, and it's, all it's doing is called check logs. So um, obviously, again, because we know like the source falls into a sync, what we can actually do is basically do the same thing we did before, where now I'm trying to find a secret value on, the cert on, my, on my application, where, <coughs> sorry, um, if I can see my screen, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're basically creating a variable called var, you know, file system, require the file system, then we're basically creating a path to that <coughs> attribute you want to pull off the server, and then it's echoing it out. <coughs> Could I have some more war if that's okay? <coughs> Sorry. Um, obviously, the actual secure way of doing things when you're reviewing codes is to look at the request and the response. And basically, rather than directly adding that information into an eval function, is to basically just call those functions directly. So in this sense, we're checking that user input matches something that we want to actually go away and access. And if it doesn't match that, then it basically says we have a problem. Um, so now I'm going to show you another example, which means I stay here. Now, this is a JavaScript application. Thanks. And we have a very similar concept where <coughs> JavaScript has this idea of scopes. And when scopes are defined, there are things that are accessible in the view. So if we take a look at this application, all it's really doing is defining a, an object of friends, <coughs> assigning those names and phone numbers to um, properties. And then in the client, we're calling an ng uh, repeat function of those friends and we're ordering by a certain value. Now, when you start to look at these frameworks and understand areas of concern, like in this sense, whenever you see a pipe operator in an ng repeat, you can see that the order by will actually be um, evaluating those expressions. So if user input from a user input from an interested source falls un into this order by function here, then it's a problem. So if we take a look at what this is actually doing, it's assigning order by by default to be phone. Then it's calling if the window location search exists, which in this case, if you're including um, you know, a window, it's going to exist. And then all it's doing is splitting the value and it's taking the first attribute, well, this, uh, uh, not, well the second attribute. So it would be taking whatever the value was and now is. So, and as you can see, this is coming from user input because the window location, uh, and we're splitting it via wet user input. It's then going to be assigned to the order by, which then falls into a source of taint when it falls under the order by filter. So if we take a look at this in practice, um, uh, okay. So, you know, first we can order by name, by phone. Like what it normally does. We can also, you know, order by age, and we can also order by, you know, number. And um, so that's good. But then, you know, it comes a problem where <laughs> if you then use a JavaScript evaluation as a call in the constructor and the function. Can, oh, <coughs> I did it on my other side. If we then call a constructor with its function constructor and then call alert, it's going to actually be allowed to evaluate into JavaScript. Now that might seem a bit confusing, but all we're really doing is following source and sync into taint and then identifying the security issue. So if we go back to the code, we can take a look at a secure example of this. And it's doing basically the, exactly the same thing taking source, but it's first validating that through strict input to make sure that it matches the properties of friends. So Basically, if the friends are not undefined, and then it's looking to see if it has the property of the friends inside order by. So if it doesn't match age, name, or phone number, then ignore it. So if we tried to then execute, the code wouldn't actually work anymore. So 
you would want to be able to try and traverse the application in this way to see if these things are actually a problem. And I don't know if there's any um, commercial tool currently that's finding these kind of problems. That you know, Fortify now supports um, um, it now supports AngularJS, but it depends how smart their rules are, which probably aren't very smart. So. And there's also like a concept of um, there may be support for it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they actually have security rules. So uh, it maybe it, it maybe it's code quality, maybe it's uh, in the sense of um, security as well, but maybe less of a, a concern. So I do have a, a small disclaimer. I do work for one of these companies, but <coughs> uh, I'm going to ignore them from the list because I want you to choose what works for you. So. You've got some commercial products um, that basically do perform JavaScript taste analysis. So it will go from source to sync and try and see if any data is tainted. And there's a wide range of tools. And um, the tools that I'm going to go more into detail today are basically the tools that look for areas of interest and mainly because these are open source. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and basically there's lots of areas. They basically will point out things like semantic analysis and semantic analysis is a simple concept of you have um, values and those values might be classed as dangerous. So dollar, dollar eval in AngularJS is classed as, as dangerous. So you would want to look for that point of interest. So like there's, if you're, a, if you're a pen tester, you already have some of these available through like things like the Burt Passive Scanner. There's also a ScanJS, but it's deprecated. There's also JS Hint and JS Lint, which are still actively worked on. But uh, today I'm going to talk about ESLint uh, in a little while after I go through the rest of the tools. There's also tools, so like for example, if you're building applications or working with development teams, there's a lot of um, security issues that can actually happen in products that have already been created, like AngularJS, you know, React, or even these things on NPM that you actively down, download because they look cool. So tools like Retired, RetireJS, NSP, and uh, SNCC will uh, try and identify um, known security issues in, in public pack packages of like on, on NPM. And then there's basically tools that uh, deobfuscate and um, optimize JavaScript. So the reason why I talk about Clojure, Clojure Compiler is an optimizer, but when you're looking at deobfuscated codes, <coughs> you want to get to the point where you can remove the things you don't want to look at. So what Clojure Compiler will do will basically optimize dead code and get rid of it. And that's quite good when you're looking at lots of code that, you know, get rid of the stuff that doesn't make any sense or is not needed and get rid of it. And JS Stillery is, uh, it only got released a couple of days ago by Minded Security. And what it does is partial evaluation. So, and partial evaluation is basically the concept of um, partly executing the code to see the results. And it does, you know, there's a thing called Mind, I don't, Mindfuck, I think the project's called. And it's just basically brackets and pluses and exclamation points. And JS Stillery will actually identify what that produces. And other tools can't do that. Is that what it is? JS. JS, but okay, sorry. Sorry for the profanity. Um, so <laughs> uh, ESLint has slowly became my favorite go-to tool and many of the developers as well. Um, basically, it's a linter. And what linters do will go through an AST and basically look for code quality and security yeah. issues. And basically, it was allowed developers to create and enforce rules on, on the software. And, a lot of developers won't actually allow their code to go out to production until most of their coding, not the security ones that get flagged, it's more about the code quality issues and making sure the style looks nice. Let's get rid of that out of the way. Um, and basically there's also, it integrates into the CI CD pipeline, which is quite nice. I'm not sure about like, uh, I know it definitely works with Git hooks, so you can, you know, it's just a command line tool, you can uh, execute it. And if any warnings pop up, it's uh, gonna flag you as no. And it also allows custom rules for, you know, specific domains. And because from what I uh, could see, this is extremely popular right now. Uh, this was the state of JS from 2017. And it basically said that it was used roughly between two and three times more compared to any of the other linting tools. And it's completely customizable. You can create your own rules. And the reason why I'm quite happy with this is because I do a lot of code review when it comes to JavaScript. And ESLint can be used uh, by security consultants to basically identify points of interest very quickly. So whenever you're starting a new project, there's basically these uh, security configs that you can use, which are like uh, on ESLint RCs, 
And ultimately, there's support for Node.js, Vanilla.js, and what I'll talk to you today is about the rules that I created for AngularJS. There's also React, and there's a list of security rules. Like what we talked about before with the post message, there, there's one which basically says you can't have the wildcard, you have to define the origin. And that's quite good when it comes to actually sending data back to clients. Uh, and there's also things like, you know, no, no and safe inner HTML. So that's when you're assigning attributes to the inner HTML. And that means like when it's represented in the DOM, it's actually going to be treated as HTML. <coughs> and, and that's quite bad. So, you know, when you're creating your own rules, like, you know, you have to have a problem and you want to have, be able to make a solution. So, you know, every Angular pen test I had, I had to basically go through, okay, what have I done in the past? What have I looked for? And basically try and re re reproduce that again. So what I did was I went through a lot of the issues that we've found through research and through pen testing um, and created a list of a bunch of ESLint rules that will identify problem locations. And, you know, the current rules I've created are, are really just to be used as a point of interest, but I want to make them more useful for developers as well. Um, and it will identify things like security misconfigurations where SCE providers disabled. And when that's disabled, then you basically got cross-site scripting throughout most of your Angular app. Um, you've also got like expression injection. So when data goes into an expression, it can be evaluated into JavaScript. And there's also, because of the client-side routing aspect, there's also things like, you know, client-side open redirection. And of course, on the roadmap, there's more rules. There's Angular 2 and 4 support, which obviously the framework was completely re rewritten. And I want to be able to identify the, the maintain, maintaining of state of like variable declarations. So we can actually have some kind of smart taint analysis. So these are the steps that I would generally recommend on creating a rule. You want to create a test with a true positive and a false positive. So something that should pass the test and something that shouldn't, relatively simple. Um, <coughs> you then want to walk the JavaScript AST and identify your requirements. Um, you can create the rule from AST output and then basically make sure the test passes. So this is how you create a test in ESLint. Uh, ultimately, you <coughs> require the rule that you want to test for. Um, so in this sense, it was basically making sure SCE is disabled or not. Well, if it is disabled, report it as an issue. You um, import you know, ESLint's uh, rule tester. And then you basically create a valid code. This should pass because it doesn't do anything. You know, if it's enabled to true, that's good. And by default, it's automatically on. So that should never really be there anyway. <coughs> and then basically, if it's disabled you know, to off, I actually want to flag it as a warning. And the way you would represent that is by identifying your requirements. And this is using the visualiz visualization tool that I showed earlier. And basically, when you take a look at what this actually attributes is, it's there's a member expression, and a member expression is just you know, two values that are you know, parent and a, and a child. So you have you know, your SCE provider and enabled. And then to be able to then jump out and look at the arguments, you'd have to go to the call expression that gets called. So you'd have to go back up to the parent node and take a look at the arguments to see if it's set to false. So this is the rule that's making it. It's relatively simple. So you call your member expression, and basically you're making to see if the object name is set to SCE provider and if it's enabled. And then I'm accessing the parent and grabbing the arguments, or the first argument, because there's, in this sense, there's never normally one, you know, more than one. And then we're seeing if it sets default. And if it is, then, then, it, then it complains. So I'm going to give a quick demo on ESLint. And then we're done with the presentation. So um, let's find the code again. There we go. Can't find it. Okay. So this is the config that I've created that is publicly available online. And all it's doing is basically using the rules that I, I want to look for. So some of these uh, I've already, so there's, let's take a look at demo.js. Demo.js is basically just jQuery. And I've kind of threw a couple of my naughty areas of interest in, in the code base. It's quite a big code base and you know it has like a lot of different functions and it passes it relatively simply. So now if we go to, um, if I can find it, is it this one? No. Yeah. Okay. So, and we want to use that against the code base. Oh, I can't see it anymore. Can anyone see that? No. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Let's. So I tried to zoom in to make it more um, viewable, but it doesn't seem to be. 
<clears throat> and again, let's try again. Let's go smaller. Okay, so I mean, it's very difficult to see now, but basically, we're calling ESLint with basically saying we don't want to provide a config, and I give my own profile, which is the .erc, and we're scanning that code project. So if now if I just run with my rule set, now it's obviously it's flagged the compile dangerous version on line 16, it's com uh, flagged the SCE trust as, and it's also on like line 9386, the SCE provider is also set to false. So um, this is basically a great way when you're starting to do code review to basically point out areas of interest. Now, obviously going, if you change a value from SC provider is now X, it's not going to find it anymore. So which is why there's a limitations right now, but ultimately I want to get to the point where there's more um, smart syntactical ways of doing it. Okay. So in summary, JavaScript is a weird and wonderful language. Um, you know, when you're looking at you know, issues, like try and learn one issue very well rather than trying to learn them all in one go. Um, and you do have to be concerned of JavaScript, not just on the client side and on the server, but understanding like the, the underlying static analysis process can actually help you identify issues quickly and uh, faster and quickly. And obviously use these tools, but don't rely on them because as I mentioned before, there's lots of limitations. There's you know, false negatives where it just doesn't know where the issue is. There's false positives. There's also, you know, true findings that it will find, but do not rely on them. Um, you know, make sure you're also doing, you know, you're doing your checks and balances and making sure you look in a manual presence. So that's the end of the presentation. For any questions, I think we have a couple of minutes, five minutes. Okay, so the question was about fatigue and when you're giving developers rules to use, but then they're complaining about things like triple equals because it's not allowed anymore, but they need it for certain, or double equals and it's not allowed anymore, but they need it for certain options or operations. I think like, the answer is that you kind of need to just come to a middle ground. And if that rule is in particularly a problem, then disable it in the rule pack, but then you would have to do some extra verifications like from, like from the security team would have to be aware of those risks and then actually perform some manual analysis against the new code base that's shipping to see if they, it actually is a problem. Because obviously if it's no longer in the rules and they don't, it's not being flagged, it's gonna be, it could be a risk and it's one of those things. But you know, obviously the configurations are customizable so you can, they can, the developers can disable them if they need to, which is scary. But, uh, but uh, you know, it offers flexibility, and but the, the, there are a lot of edge cases and problems with that, yeah, that's for sure. But I, I don't know the answer. I think just having to work with the development teams and trying to, you know, identify a middle ground and just going, mm, okay, maybe we can take off that rule for now, and then maybe work on, like, critical applications, for example, if there's, like, you know, the payment systems, for example, of your applications, they have to follow those rules, but maybe the client-side code is something that you know for a different application that is a level a lower level of risk then maybe that's okay but it obviously may impact productivity which is the only concern as well try a bigger stick you try a bigger stick yeah it's <laughs> a good one uh any other questions uh how useful or, or not useful is ESLint on finding issues in minified or obfuscated code I haven't tried it. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know the answer, but I mean, obviously, when I'm looking at minified codes, like, I will run rules against them, but because because obviously it's changing the values normally to like you know smaller attributes, it, it won't pick up the static rules. So you would either have to like if you're doing like a pen test from for an organization, you'd go, can you please give me the full source code? And they go no, and you go okay. So um, then you would basically start to just have to manually investigate the code and use things like JS Stillery or um, you know 
a closure compiler to try and get rid of code you don't need and then manually look at it. And then if you can actually start to identify patterns, you can probably change the code back into what it was and then rerun the rules. But then that's, you've defeated the purpose of the rules in the first place. But yeah, that, that's, I think it's you know, definitely problematic unless you can write some very smart rules to be able to do things like um, you know, um, val you know, following state. So when a, a new variable declaration happens and it's a value that you know could be dangerous, you have to track that all the way through the application but that's probably going to be quite memory intensive and uh, very problematic. But yeah. So it's, it's kind of a follow on, and yeah. I admit a little off topic for, for the talk, but uh, do you have any recommendations for tools for doing runtime or, or dynamic analysis, for, particularly around tracking the lifetime of tainted variables? So the question was around uh, the lifetime of. Uh, tracking variables uh, for like potential sources of change. Do you mean around um, actually debugging dynamic code or you mean actually when that you've identified there's a problem and how long it's been around for? Uh, so I guess as an example, um, if a variable's been tainted by user data from it's like location.search, for example, sure, sure. Uh, and, and tracking those things at runtime dynamically to see when they hit syncs like set interval or eval, uh, mm -hmm. do, do you have any advice around so there, there are like tools like there's there was one called Dom, uh, Dominator, but it changed its name to Blue Closure Detect, and it basically is kind of like a brute forcer for those kind of attributes. So Blue Closure to Detect will basically just brute force like identify known sources and known sinks and just hammer them away until it executes something. Okay. And uh, it's it's you know it's I don't know if they've improved the rule set or if they've changed the way they do it, but that was one way to do it. There's also one way to do it where um, you know, adding debugs like debugger like kind of captions into code and just stepping through it to see, you know, what happens. And obviously, you know, glorified greps always help. So, um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. For you know, the way I would do it anyway. I don't. I'm sure there's probably smarter ways. Okay. Yeah, I would re probably reach out to a guy called Live Overflow, and he has lots of amazing yeah. YouTube videos yeah. around. Uh, Kind of like identifying things like pop under uh, things, where he's basically debugging the code, finding how all these things work, and I'm sure he has a better explanation for those kind of things. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you for attending. Hopefully, it was helpful, and I will put, be putting the slides up in the next ten minutes. So, if you want to watch, like look at them again and get all the links and stuff from the presentation. They'll be on my slide deck and I'll tweet it out. So thank you.